Good. Well, welcome back. And uh, thanks for that wonderful refreshment, coffee and uh, lunch all on go. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on in uh, the notes that you've got to uh, where we're up to. Uh, yeah. Page three is where we need to go next, which you see is entitled The Law Was Motivated by the Mission of God for Israel. All that I was saying in the last major section in relation to the law being founded upon grace could be described as, in some ways, a backward-looking perspective. Because what is being said, effectively, is uh, obey God because of what He has done. You look back, you look to the Exodus, you look to the history, and uh, in response to the story so far, you say, therefore, how should we now live? What is our ethical response to what God has already done for us in the past? This next major point, really, is looking in the opposite direction. It's looking forward. <clears throat> and it's saying, what is God's purpose? What is the future hold out of which we should live now in relation to God's law and in obedience to God. So that's what I mean by motivated by the mission of God in and for and through Israel. Another way of, of uh, introducing this point would be to put it like this. For many years, indeed one might say ever since the New Testament, Christians have been asking the question, why the law? Why is the law there? Why did God give it? What are we supposed to do with it? Why the law? And I think we might have saved ourselves a great deal of ink and sweat and blood and tears uh, if we'd stopped to ask a prior question, which is, why Israel? Meaning, of course, Israel in the Old Testament. Because it was, after all, to Israel that God gave the law. And God had a purpose in the creation of Israel to which his law giving must have been related. So you see the point I'm trying to make. If we treat the law simply as a great big blob of biblical stuff which we have to somehow or other deal with and ask what are we meant to do with these chapters, uh, we, we get all caught up in that question of what is this for? Why do we do this? Why this law? Whereas if we say, well, when we look at it, this law is given in a very clear, particular context. It's given to this people, Israel. So why Israel? Why did they exist? What was their purpose for existence? And then we can ask, why did God give the law to such people? What's the function of the law in relation to the function of Israel in the purposes of God? That's the angle that I'm trying to come at this point from, from now. <clears throat> And in order to answer that, of course, we have to go back to the beginning. Always a good place to start, I can say. Uh, and we go back in the case of Israel, the beginning, of course, is Abraham. And that's why uh, the opening bullets point there on, on your uh, section 3 starts at Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. God called and created this people of Israel because of the promise that he made to Abraham in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, for a reason for which he created Israel in the first place. And that was to be a blessing to the nations, or rather to be the means through which God intended to bless the nations. Uh, you might want to turn up Genesis 12, 1 to 3, because it is a very crucial text uh, in understanding the whole of the scripture, really. Uh, it's not only foundational for Israel's self-understanding in the Old Testament, it's certainly foundational to Jesus and the Apostle Paul, uh, and indeed the whole Scripture. You know the story so far up to this point. Uh, the human race has gone badly wrong in sin and rebellion uh, ever since the fall in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 followed by the jealousy, anger, and violence and murder of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, followed by the corruption and violence of the whole human race and the wickedness of human hearts, which leads to the flood 
uh, in uh, chapter 6 uh, to 8, 9, and then, of course, the story of the Tower of Babel, the kind of climax of human arrogance, uh, as it were, concentrated in this attempt to make a great name for themselves and build the Tower of the Heaven, Genesis 11. And in the context of all of that, we might ask, where can this story possibly go next? What can God do next? He's tried everything, it seems, and uh, we are still in a mess. So where does the story go next? How can God redeem such a, a situation? And the answer is that God looks down and sees Abraham and Sarah and says, I love them. And you can imagine the sharp intake of breath among the angels in heaven at that point when God revealed his plan. And who? What? You know, they're, what is it, 70, 80, 90 years old? They haven't even got a child. Um, and God says, yeah, well, but that, it'll do. That's the start of my whole project of world evangelization. And it begins with this uh, old man Abraham and his wife Sarah. So in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, we read, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go, go to the land I will show you. That's the first command, go. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and I will make your name great. Those are the three following clauses. And be a blessing. Uh, the last line of verse 2 is also the imperative in the Hebrew. Be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So here really, in my opinion, is the first and greatest great commission in the Bible. Long before Matthew 28 uh, and the great commission at the end of the Gospel, here is God's great commission to Abraham. It's a command to history. Go and be a blessing and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. That's God's mission, God's purpose. And it seems to me fundamental, I couldn't emphasize this uh, too much, that in whatever way we think and study and argue and talk about the nature of Israel in the Old Testament, we need to remember that everything in and to do with Israel in the Old Testament ultimately has this wide-angle vision of God's ultimate purpose for the nation. Uh, Israel is never an end in itself in the Old Testament. Uh, it's God and Israel for the sake of the nations. Now I know, of course, that uh, as you read the Old Testament, Israel tends to fill the frame of the focus. It, it seems all the time that this is the people that God is dealing with. And they quite often forgot the other nations or forgot that they were meant to be ultimately for the sake of other nations. And they became very nationalistic, very chauvinistic, very arrogant. But all the time, God's ultimate purpose stated here at the very beginning is his desire to bless the nations. There's a universal frame of reference for the particularity of God's election of Israel. Say that again. There's a universal frame of reference that is all the nations, the whole of humanity, the whole of history, for the particularity of God's election of Israel. <clears throat> One way I sometimes use to illustrate that uh, when I'm preaching, the sort of preacher's illustration really, uh, is that um, I'm the father of four, but I've uh, got two daughters, two sons. Two sons are now in their 30s, but when they were little boys, uh, as a dutiful father, I used to go and watch them play football for their boys' brigade football team. Uh, and I took along my camera, I was very proud of it, or practica, I don't know if they make them anymore these days, um, camera with, with, with a telephoto lens and a doubler, so I could actually get 400 mil uh, focal length, which was, which was quite good in those days. And with that telephoto lens, I could really fill the whole frame with, with one of my boys as I was looking. But I had this habit when I was there on the touchline of looking through the camera with both eyes open, which you don't use, you sort of close one eye to look through the lens. I kept both eyes open because with one eye, I was looking through the camera, uh, and with that eye, I was filling the frame with, with Tim, my son. You know, where he was, I was following him around, uh, and I could see whether he was anywhere near the ball, which wasn't often the case. Um, and when he would fall over, I got some really great shots by, by having him so fully in the frame. With my other eye, I was kind of watching the game, you know, just sort of seeing where all the play was, where the ball was, and so on. So you're kind of aware of the rest of the match going on. And as I thought about it, it's, it's a bit like that when we're reading the Old Testament, because as in the case of that camera and my son, 
the main frame is filled with my son. Tim is my firstborn son, as God said about Israel in Exodus. And we've got a relationship going a long way back, me and my son Tim. Uh, and so my focus is on him. It's my, he's my precious firstborn son, and so I'm filling the frame with his reality. But he is only there because there's a match going on with all the rest of the players involved. And so, when we look at Israel in the Old Testament, yes, it's so filled with Israel, because as God says, Israel is my firstborn son, my covenant people, you only have I known of all the nations of the earth, all that stuff, yeah. But Israel is only there because there's a match going on, the whole of human history. And the God of Israel is the God of all the earth, and the God of all the nations. And it explicitly says that this God of Israel is the God who is moving the nations around in his providence, in his sovereignty who calls one, uses them, and sets them aside. So he's the God of all history, and he's the God of the ultimate future to bring blessing to all nations, tribes, and peoples, and languages, as Revelation 7 says. So we need, therefore, in everything in relation to Israel, to look to that ultimate purpose of God for the nation. That's an important, again, assumptive framework in which I want to interpret Old Testament law, and we look a little bit later at how it fits in terms of treating Israel as a paradigm. So that's Genesis 12. Now then, why did I put in the next references, which is Genesis 18, verses 18 and 19? Well, because what happens here in Genesis 18 is that God's ethical requirement on the people of Abraham, Israel, as yet to come, has the same universal breadth of reference within this verse. God has called Abraham, God wants to bless all the nations, but in the middle is the ethical requirement that God is going to make on these people to live according to his ways, which of course is another way of expressing by keeping God's law, as it would be uh, from Exodus onwards. Now look at, uh, if you would please, at Exodus 18. Uh, the context of this uh, little section is the story of God being on his way to bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, which is what happens in chapter 19. <clears throat> but on his way, God stops off with two of his angels, with Abraham and Sarah, to have a meal. And Abraham and Sarah initially think that these are just three men who turned up uh, one afternoon. And so uh, uh, Abraham tells Sarah to prepare a meal, and uh, they do, and they sit and they eat. And as the meal goes on, it becomes apparent uh, to Abraham and Sarah, although it had been apparent to the reader a little bit earlier, that's something of the irony within the chapter, a very brilliant chapter, it becomes apparent to Abraham and Sarah that this man who's talking to them is known none other than the Lord himself, uh, because he knows Sarah's name, and uh, he knows that she laughed, even though she laughed inside herself. And so he's a pretty uh, amazing guy. But what he says is, in the course of this, um, that he first of all promises Abraham and Sarah that they're going to have a son by next spring. Not just a baby, but a son. You know, he knows the sex of the child as well, before scanning or anything else. They're going to have a son. Uh, and of course, uh, Sarah finds that rather funny, um, possibly in a rather bitter sense of humor. So she does exactly what Abraham did in chapter 17. She laughs. Both Abraham and Sarah thought it was a big joke when God said that they were going to have a son when they were 100 years old. It doesn't often happen. Uh, so there's a little bit of comedy in here, I think, uh, because um, God says, why did Sarah laugh? I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. Why no, didn't? Yes, you did. And it's a slightly pantomime uh, going on in the first part. But then, then, God tells Abraham what he's about to do and why he's about to do it. That he's actually on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah, and he intends to bring judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah if their wickedness is as great as he's hearing about it up in heaven. It's a wonderful sort of human language. So what I'm reading to you now is from verse 16. I think that's the best place to start. So Genesis 18, verse 16. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said to himself, the kind of soliloquy, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. That's a repetition of chapter 12, verse 3. For I have chosen him 
so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, literally in Hebrew, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see that what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. That's the context. An outcry, a cry of pain, a cry of cruelty, crying out for help that's coming up from Sodom and Gomorrah. God says, I've heard people crying. It's come by us. Someone's crying, Lord, in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going down to see what's going on. And on the way to bring judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah, God stops and reminds himself of his redemption. This is so typical of God. This is God, Goddy. Right? Uh, because God, it seems, can never act in judgment without simultaneously acting in redemption. It, it, it's, it's always there in the Bible, even from the flood right on through. The Exodus is an act of judgment and of salvation. And here God is going to judge Sodom, but he reminds himself of who this man Abraham is. And Abraham is not just a man who happens to have a pretty good cook for a wife, uh, Sarah. He's actually the key to God's whole purposes for the world. And so he says, I have chosen this man ultimately so that I can keep what I promised, which is to bring blessing to the nations. But in the middle, says God, in the middle of verse 19, so that he will teach his children and his household to keep the way of the Lord. Now, if you didn't know it, that expression, the way of the Lord, is the clearest you'll ever get in the Old Testament to what we would call Old Testament ethics. See, I think if you'd ever gone up and asked, you know, Hannah or Samuel or some Old Testament believer, uh, could you tell me about Old Testament ethics, please? Then he probably said, what? Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. But if you said, can you explain to me the way of the Lord? Ah, now I know what you mean. The way of Yahweh. Yes, that is the way which he is, his actions, his works, his ways, and how we are to follow in his footsteps, to be like him, to walk in the way of the Lord. So uh, a Hebrew reader would know that this follow in the way of the Lord was an ethical term, but just in case there was any misunderstanding. He adds to it these two great big Hebrew words, doing righteousness and justice, which of course is a fundamental quality of the law in the Old Testament and repeatedly used in the law, the Psalms and the prophets as the ways in which people are meant to, to live and to work in social and personal righteousness and justice. So, I'm going to go over to this whiteboard and draw something on there, and I, so I'm not quite sure whether it will continue on the tape or whether, should I take the microphone with me? Do, do we know which ones? What, what should I do? Because I, I want to sort of use this. Uh, can I use the hand mic? Yeah, and it, then, it, then... It, won't, it won't work. It won't, it won't record. Ah. So, um, what should I do? Uh, it depends which one of these is actually the tape recording. Or they oh. I will try. I will speak. I will speak as loud as I can. Can you hear me if I speak like this? Right. Yeah. Okay, good. This is the recording part. Yeah. So we're talking here then about Genesis 18, 19. And did you and if you notice yeah, okay. <coughs> If you notice within it, there are two expressions, so that, so that, it occurs twice. So that means there are three phrases in the verse. Phrase one, so that. Phrase two, so that. Phrase three. That's the way the verse is structured. So what we have is, God says, first of all, I have chosen him. Okay? Then we get, so that. Then we get, way of the Lord, righteousness and justice. So that. And then we get God saying to keep his promise, which he's just said in the last verse, is blessing the nations, all the nations. So what 
I hope you can see here, I'll move this side so you can see it. There's these three elements. One, choice. Two, ethics. Three, God's promise. It seems to me that you could put a word to each of those phrases and it would go something like this. I have chosen him. That's God's election. If God had not chosen Abraham, there would have been no people of Israel. It goes right back to there. Abraham did nothing except respond to God's choice. So there's this kind of axiomatic election by God, his choice and calling of Abraham. I chose him. That's what God said. But why did I do that? So that he would be the beginning of a community that would be different from the way of Sodom and Gomorrah. In a world which is living like Sodom and Gomorrah, the way of outcry and wickedness and perversion and oppression, in a world living that way, God wants a community committed to the way of the Lord. That's ethics. Election, ethics, so that God can keep his promise to Abraham, which was to bless all the nations, which we could call mission. Now what I'm wanting you to see is that between these three elements of the verse, which is all one sentence, election, ethics, and mission, they're all joined together by this sense of God's purpose, God's intention. That's the so that that occurs in between the three ones. So election is in order that the people will live in a certain way, and that is so that God can fulfill his promise to Abraham. The verse is grammatically and theologically connected in this way. The whole purpose of election is ultimately because God wants to bless the nations, and the means by which God will bless the nations is through the elect people of God living in a way which actually reflects God rather than reflecting Sodom and Gomorrah. You see the logic that I'm trying to put together? Now, when we move out of the book of Genesis and we come to Exodus, the Leviticus, Deuteronomy, this central section, the ethics, the way of the Lord, the righteousness and justice, is effectively consolidated in God's law. God's law is the means by which the people of Abraham are to live according to the way of the Lord. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy uses that phrase quite often, the way of the Lord. We look at uh, uh, it a little bit later again. So, perhaps I can step back up here again. And uh, come back to the microphone, make it easier with my voice. Okay, thank you. So what I'm trying to say here is that this sense of obedience to God being a dimension of Israel's mission is not just something I'm reading back into the law from our point of view, but something that's actually read forward into the law even from the book of Genesis. The whole point of ethics is for the sake of God's mission. This is what's at stake. This is uh, why uh, the connection between the ethical quality of life of God's people, on the one hand, and the mission of God's people to the nations, on the other hand, is so strong. You can't have a people of mission who aren't living in the way of the Lord, because there's no difference. The world can't see any difference, so why should they be bothered? So here is a verse, Genesis 18, verse 19, which seems to me to be crucial to, again, a biblical understanding both of ethics and law, there in the middle of the verse, and of uh, God's election and God's missionary purpose for Israel. Let's move on to another verse, and again I'll probably need to go to the screen in just a moment, but it's moving on from uh, Genesis 18 verse 19 to Exodus 19 once again. We were here a little bit earlier, but um, this is such a key text that we need to look at the second half of it. Exodus 19 verses 4 to 6. Last time we looked at this, uh, just before uh, the break in the first session, I was using it uh, to point out how God's redemption comes first. God points and says, you have seen what I have done, and how he delivered them out of Egypt. So the saving act of God 
had proceed, preceded God's requirement on them to keep the covenant. But that's looking backwards. This text also looks forwards. It doesn't only look back to the initiative of God's grace. It also looks forward to Israel's identity and role in the midst of the nations in future. So verse 5, God says, Now then, if you will obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. For the whole earth is mine. It should be for, not although. Uh, the NIV, I don't know why it makes it although, it's for. For the whole earth is mine, all belongs to God. And you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So in the context of the whole world belonging to God, all the nations belong to him, this people who will be his special possession within the midst of the nations will have a particular role and function, which is to be God's priesthood, to be a priesthood in the midst of the nations. Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. And that's repeated. You find that verse uh, referred to quite frequently in Deuteronomy and other places in the prophets and indeed in the Psalms. So if Israel is to be a priesthood among the nations, how are we to understand that? What, what does that actually mean? Well, it depends then on how we understand what a priest was and what the priests the priest did in Israel. Because obviously this concept of Israel being a priestly people in relation to the world depends upon the understanding of what priests were within Israel themselves uh, as they were to become uh, in the book of Leviticus. And once again, I need to uh, grab the um, recording mic and head to the screen and see if we can um, make this into a diagram. Uh, uh. Nothing like a bit of exercise. <laughs> I need a teaching assistant to do this for me. <laughs> right. In the Old Testament in Israel, and indeed in most human religions, the priests or the priests stood in the middle, in between God on the one hand and the rest of the people on the other. So let's put God here up at the top, where he should be, uh, and down here are the people, all the rest of the people. And in the <coughs> middle here is the priest, all right, looking very happy, uh, in the middle. Okay, so this is, this is the priest. Now what did the priest do in Israel? I'm going to grab the other one um, as well and hold them at the same time. And that will save me. stood in the middle between God and the people, and he functioned in two directions. Now it's quite important to recognize that the priests in Israel were the teachers of God's law. Now we're not quite as familiar with that as we are with the job of the priests bringing the sacrifices, but it's there. It's there in Leviticus 10, in the ordination that was of Aaron and his sons, you shall teach my people the distinction between clean and unclean, and teach them the laws of God. It's there in Deuteronomy, uh, in the blessing of the tribe of Levi, uh, that he was to be the one who would uh, teach God's law to the people, as well as bring in the burnt offerings. You find it in the prophets, in Hosea, who says there's no knowledge of God in the land. Why not? Because the priests are not teaching the people. That's the complaint of Hosea, and elsewhere. So the job of the priest then was to bring God to the people through the teaching of the law. Okay? If you wanted to know the law of God, go and ask a priest. You should have been able to do in Israel. But at the same time, and in the opposite direction, of course, and more familiar to us, is the fact that the priest's job was to bring the sacrifices of the people to God. So there was this movement from, as it were, from below to up, which was when an Israelite had uh, sinned in some way or was conscious of some uncleanness, what did you do? You 
you took an animal or whatever the prescribed offering was, you took it to the temple or the tabernacle, you grabbed some Levite priest who wasn't doing anything at the time, and you said, come here, I need you, this is my animal, this is my sacrifice, these are my sins. You slew the animal, the priest took the blood of the sacrifice, and the priest threw it against the altar, representing God, and the priest would declare to you that your sins were covered. Your sins are atoned for, uh, the language of Leviticus. And then you could come back into fellowship, and if it was a fellowship offering, you could bring your family along, and you could enjoy the meat, and have a good old barbecue and picnic there on the spot, and you were brought back into the fellowship of God's people through the function of the priest. So you see, the priest brought God to the people through teaching his law, and brought the people to God through the sacrifices. And in the process, the priests, therefore, were those who would bless the people. The Aaronic blessing in number six, a very important function of the priest, to bless the people uh, in the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. Now, if that, you see, is what the priests were in Israel, isn't it remarkably significant, a pregnant phrase, something very rich in meaning, that God says to the Israelites in Exodus 19, verse 6, you will be for me to the rest of the nations of the world who ultimately belong to me, what your priests are to you. You will be the people through whom I will become known to the nations. So we could just add an S here if we wanted. Uh, all the nations of the world, which are there in Exodus 19, uh, 4 to 6. And you will be the people through whom I will ultimately draw the nations to myself into the sphere of redemption and blessing. So through the priests, through Israel, through this people, God will come to the nations, and the nations will come to God. That's the dynamic movement of priesthood. And as you read the rest of the Old Testament, of course, you find that both those directions are there in the uh, prophetic texts. You know how you get some texts which envisage the nations coming up to Jerusalem to hear the law of God. That's there in Isaiah. What's the water? And other texts which speak about the law of God, or the name of God, or the salvation of God going out to the nations. This double movement, drawing the nations in and the law and so on going out. Now that, says God, that is the fundamental purpose of Israel. They are meant to be a priesthood in the midst of the nations. Now if that is the case, of course, uh, then they must also live lives which are holy. So that's why the priestliness of Israel, in this verse, is linked to the holiness of Israel. Because to be holy is to be different. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. So are you with me so far? We've seen in Genesis 18, verse 19, that the call of Abraham anticipates God's purpose to bless the nations through a community committed to ethical values, the way of the Lord. Exodus 19 speaks of Israel as a priesthood of God in the midst of the nations, committed to representing God, showing what God is like to the nations, and ultimately bringing the nations to God. And the other text that I wanted to bring here to show this was the one I referred to last night, if you were here last night, which is Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 to 8. Because here the law has actually been given already. We're now in the context in Deuteronomy. Uh, we're no longer back in the patriarchal days when it was just Abraham. No longer are we at Mount Sinai itself with God giving the law. Now, with the book of Deuteronomy, we're actually on the edge of the promised land. The Israelites are about to move forward. It's second generation Israel now, after the Exodus. And so the law has already been given, but what Deuteronomy does is repeatedly to motivate the Israelites to keep the law. If you read Deuteronomy, you'll find again and again that motivational language is very common. Do this so that, or because, or in order that, something else will happen. That kind of motivational language is a feature of Deuteronomy. And so here in Deuteronomy chapter 4, the motivation is surprisingly linked to the nations. I say surprisingly because the nations haven't really had much of a good time up to this point. They've mostly been getting defeated or moved around or one thing or another. Uh, and so in, the, in this book of Deuteronomy, it's, it's almost a bit of a surprise that all of a sudden, here in chapter 4, Moses urges the Israelites to keep God's law, verse 4, sorry, sorry, verse 6, chapter 4, verse 6, 
Observe these laws carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations. We will hear about all these decrees and will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them, the way the Lord our God is near us, whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws that I'm setting before you today? So Moses said, look, Israel, if you will keep God's law, then not only will it be a response to God's grace in the past, as he said elsewhere, chapter 6 and one, but it will also be a feature of your witness to the nations in the future. This is how the nations will recognize something about the God we worship and ask questions about the God we worship, this God who is so near to us. Because they will see the righteousness of the laws by which we live. And so the sense that Israel was to be a model to the nations, a picture of the kind of society that God wanted there to be in order that the nations would see and recognize and indeed admire because that's the kind of language that's there in these verses. Obedience to God's law is meant to raise questions by creating a model community. You see how that picks up exactly the same theme of the Abraham text. See, God says, I want Abraham to teach his people to be the kind of community that walks by the way of the Lord in righteousness and justice in the context of a world which walks in the way of Sodom and Gomorrah in the language of exploitation and oppression and perversion. So in the midst of our world, here is to be a people who are different. Now, I mentioned a moment ago this sense of the holiness of Israel, the distinctiveness of Israel, and that's the next bullet point on your page. Very important that those two phrases went together, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. To be a priesthood in the midst of the nations meant that the Israelites had to be different from the nations. And that word holy or holiness, in fact, essentially means distinctive, different. When God said the Israelites would be a holy nation, he didn't mean that they would be a religious nation or any more religious than anybody else. Uh, that's not the point. I mean, everybody is religious one way or another. And God's got quite enough religion, I think, to last them for all eternity. He doesn't need any more religion around the place. What God calls for is holiness, which is different, and is being different. The best way, I think, that I can explain the sense of the distinctiveness of Israel as the essence of their holiness is by those texts in Leviticus, which I have referred to there on your page. Uh, first of all, Leviticus 18, verse 3. The Lord says to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as many do in Egypt, where you used to live. And you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you, where you're going to live. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my decrees, because I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and laws, for the man who obeys them will live by them. That's the text, by the way, that uh, our brother mentioned from Romans, that Paul quotes in Romans 10. But the essence of that first part, you can see, is clearly distinction. God says, look, Israel, you've come out of Egypt, and you know how they live in Egypt. You're not to live that way. You're not to follow the practices of imperial idolatry, the idolizing of power and empire and wealth and might, the kind of uh, idolatrous, evil, oppressive society that Egypt can become. You're not to live like that. And you must not do as they do in Canaan, which had a somewhat different kind of religion associated more with fertility cults and the deifying of sex and then the sacrificing of babies, which resulted from the sacred sex. Uh, and all that kind of very perverted, degraded religion that was there in Canaan and that went along with a form of social oppression because all the land was owned by little kings who kept everybody else in slavery. And so Canaan had become a very degraded, 
oppressive and wicked society, such that God was going to judge it uh, through the agency of the Israelites. So God says you're not to follow the idolatry and wickedness of Egypt or the idolatry and wickedness of Canaan. You are to be different. You're to follow my ways and my laws, such as I'm giving you. So that's a very clear text about ethical distinctiveness. It's then followed up in chapter 19, the next passage uh, there on your sheet, a very famous verse, uh, and I think quite helpful to us in understanding this point that I'm making. Leviticus 19, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Or you shall be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, as I said, what does that mean? Does that mean you're to be very religious, because I'm God, and we're all religious once you've got God in? No. If you actually read the rest of this chapter, uh, you will see that almost all the laws in it are not quotes about what we might think of as religion in a, in a ritual or practical way. Uh, I used to do this exercise when I was teaching in India, and I taught the Pentateuch, and uh, when we got to this part of Leviticus, I used to say to the class, okay, now look, read through this chapter, which says you've got to be holy, and make a note of all the laws within it which have to do with religion in our sense of the word, or religious practice, or ritual, or ceremony, or something like that. And so you can do that, and there's a few. Uh, there are laws about idols, and there's a few laws about sacrifices, uh, and a few things like that. So, how many are? Not very many. So I then say, well, look at all the rest of the chapter. What kind of laws are there in the rest of the chapter? And the answer is that they are about down-to-earth, everyday, ordinary life. It's to do with your family. It's to do with your farm, how you reap the harvest and leave food for the poor. It's about the neighborhood and how you treat people within the neighborhood. It's about the workplace and how you pay your workers, in verse 13. It's about care for the disabled verse 14. It's about the law courts in verse 18. It's about sexual behavior in verse 20. It's about equality before the law for all ethnic communities, as I was saying earlier, in verse 33. It's about the marketplace and your soul and your business in verse 35 and so on. So here's a chapter which says to Israel, you're to be holy but which actually is down-to-earth practical holiness, in which you are to be different from the nations. So what that verse really means is, you are to be a different kind of people, because I am a different kind of God. I'm not your average, everyday, national fertility God. I'm not like the gods of Egypt. I'm not like Baal, the god of Canaan. I am Yahweh, your God, and therefore you've got to be like me. You've got to be different in compassion and justice and purity. So, do you see the kind of dynamic of what I'm building up here? This is not just, as we saw earlier, interpreting and handling the law as a response to God's grace in the past. Why should we obey God's law? Because God saved us. This is interpreting the law with an eye on what God wants to do for those who are not yet the people of God, the non-Israelites in the Old Testament those who are not yet Christians, those who live around us, the nations, the Gentiles, as, as the Old Testament call it. God's mission is that through this people, He will have a community that will ultimately be uh, the agent of God's blessing to the nations. And if that is the role of Israel, then the function of the law was to shape Israel, to make them into the kind of people who could be a blessing to the nations. The function of the law is missional, is what I'm trying to say. It fits in with God's purpose, God's intention to bless the nation. That's why it's so important that the Israelites should be distinctive and different, because if they were no different from the nations, then there'd be no message, no mission, no blessing for the nations. Now, I thought it was worthwhile just trying to uh, ram this point home by showing that it's not just the Old Testament which places ethics on in this missional framework. 
the New Testament has the same kind of dynamic. And that's why I put uh, these three or four verses in from the New Testament, from the Gospels and the Epistles, just to show that something of the same sort happens when Jesus and the Apostles talk about the reason why we, as Christians, should live in ways that uh, are obedient and reflective of God's character. So, for example, Matthew 5, verse 14 to 16. Jesus, I'm sure, shocked his disciples when he said to them, Hey, you guys, you know who you are? You are the light of the world. Hey, what? Us? They were a pretty dusty bunch of ex-fishermen and whatnot. And yet Jesus says to them, you are the light of the world. Now, they were also Israelites, and they knew their scriptures. And they knew that the light of the world was meant to be Israel, to be a light to the nations. That's the language of Isaiah and elsewhere. Uh, the people of God were meant to be a light to the world. And so Jesus says to these disciples, yeah, that's what you are because you're part of Israel, but how are you to be a light to to the world in such a way that the world can see. Well, verse 16, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds. In other words, the way you live, the ethical quality of your living, and then come to praise, not you, but your Father in heaven. In other words, people will come to the knowledge and experience of God as Father through the witness of people whose lives are actually different. As different as light is from darkness, or as salt is from corruption, as Jesus had said in the previous verse. So that, again, you see, here is ethics, obedience, good living, set within the context of mission, mission to the nations, men, the people outside. That's Matthew 5. Uh, verses um, 14 to 16. Luke 22, verse 25, expresses the distinctiveness of, uh, of the disciples of Jesus from the way in which the Gentiles live and rule their lives. So uh, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus picks them up when they were having an argument about who was the greatest. And Jesus said to them, I'm reading now from verse 25, Luke 22, 25. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles, the Lord is over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Or as the older version put, it shall not be so among you. In other words, you are to be different from the way the world runs itself. Instead, the greatest among you, excuse me, the greatest among you should be like the um, the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. And so Jesus sets an upside down standard for Christian leadership and it's expressly said to be different from the world. So this sense that God's people are to be distinctive and to be different is clearly there in that Luke text. And then finally, uh, back again to 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 12. I think here Peter is almost certainly remembering those words of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, it spoke about uh, the light, you know, letting your light shine so that people will see. And so here he says, live such good lives among the pagans, verse 12. And the pagans, by the way, is just the nations. In fact, I, I, I'm really rather sorry that the NIV translates it as pagans. Some other versions translate it as heathen. Uh, it's just entois uh, ethnosin, it's just ethne. The, the, the normal standard word for the nations, the outside people, those who are not Jews in the Old Testament, and certainly the Christian in the New Testament, those who are not Christians. So live such good lives among the nations that although they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds. That's exactly what Jesus had said. And glorify God on the day he visits us. So you see again this sense of the missional function of ethics. Obedience, good living, is in order to be a witness to the nations around. So that leads then to this uh, Concluding point, bullet point under this, section 3. If we're going to preach the Old Testament law, we do so in order to remind Christians of their mission responsibility to live distinctively as God's people among the nations. And here is the way in which God called the Israelites to live in order that they should be distinctive.
So what kind of lessons can we learn? What can we transfer? What can we draw from the laws of the Old Testament about Israel's distinctiveness, which can then lead us in Christian ways to be distinctive from the nation? The missional purpose of Christian ethics and of the biblical law. Now I'm going to move on from this point, not to, to section four. I'm going to actually do section four until tomorrow because I want to kind of consolidate this with section five and that diagram uh, that you see there, that triangular diagram uh, in section five, which in your handout notes then um, is page five. I'll come back to uh, section four tomorrow. This is my attempt to put into a diagram something of what I've been saying up to this point. Trying on the one hand to express Israel's function in relation to the nations of the world, that is God's mission or purpose for Israel to be a blessing to the nations on the one hand, Israel's relation to the nations, and on the other hand, the law, the law's function in relation to the mission of Israel. See the two things I'm saying? On the one hand, God's purpose is that Israel would be a blessing to the nations. That's Israel's raison d'etre. That's the reason why Israel exists, is for God's saving purpose to the nations. And on the other hand, God gives his law to this people for that purpose. They are to be shaped by this law, not just so they can be happy and God will be happy and they'll all go to heaven and they die, but so that they can be a people, live as God's people in the midst of the nations. Living as God's people before the watching world uh, is the purpose of God's law. Now, if that's the case, then we can see something of the paradigm shape of Israel in relation to the rest of the nations and indeed to all of history. So what you've got in that diagram is two triangles, and the outer triangle is the basic triangle of creation. You see the outer one. I wish this could be coloured, and I would have coloured that green, uh, simply because of the earth and uh, the sort of ecology side of things, all that. But it looked nice as a green triangle. It's a cre triangle of creation. Because if you look at it, you can see the top apex is God. And then down the bottom right is the earth. God, in the beginning, created the heavens and the earth. He created the earth for us to inhabit. And so at the bottom left hand corner is humanity. All human beings, all the nations. Not just in the book of Genesis, but right through history. So in a sense, that bottom line of the triangle is where we live. It's the world, the world of human habitation, the earth, and those who live therein. So well, that's us. And all of the earth and all the peoples who live on the earth have this basic relationship and accountability to God as creator. He is the God who made us and who holds us accountable to himself, who blesses us with his gifts of creation and who expects from us thankfulness and obedience, as Romans puts it. That's the outer triangle. It's the basic biblical worldview in three points. God, the earth, and humanity, and answers so many of the worldview questions. Who we are, what the world is, where we came from, and so on, those kind of questions. But we know that that outer triangle, although it looks on your page nice and straight and neat and uh, isosceles and all that, uh, is in fact, because of our sin, very twisted and fractured and broken up. It's still there. God is still there, the earth is still here, last time I checked, and we are still here. So the fundamental corners of the biblical worldview are still there in reality, but the relationship between them is spoiled. So we as humans rebel against God, we sin against God, and so the spiritual relationship with God has been fractured and broken, or as Paul would put it, we are dead in sin. And the relationship between the earth and God has been spoiled because God says, cursed is the earth because of you. And the earth no longer responds to God in the way that he intended it. Paul puts it in Romans 8, the earth is subject to frustration because of our sin. 
And so the earth is not able to give glory to God as it ought uh, because of our sin. So the relationship between God and humanity and the earth are both twisted and spoiled, but so also is the relationship between humanity and the earth itself. Not only, as Genesis says, uh, does the earth now, as it were, resist human efforts to control and to care for it, thorns and thistles as, as uh, the language, the metaphorical language of Genesis, but also we ourselves abuse and destroy and spoil and pollute the earth. We behave towards the earth in ways that God never intended us to because of our arrogance and our greed and our injustice and all those things. So, there we are. We live in a world which is still there. This outer triangle of creation is still a creational reality, but it's also a fallen reality. We are fallen sinful human beings and we live in an earth which has been cursed by God. The inner triangle represents God's response to that. What has God done? And what God did was that he called Israel, called Abraham, out of all the nations of the earth, called this one, created them actually, not just called them, but created them. And out of all the earth, gives them this particular land to live in, in the Old Testament period. This is the land, the Lord's land, given to this people. In fact, it's more often called the Lord's land, or the land of Canaan, than it's ever called Israel's land. That occurs only about four times in the whole Old Testament. But it's the land God gives to Israel, within the context of his purpose for the whole earth and for all the nations. So what we see then in this inner triangle of God's redemptive work in the Old Testament is a kind of parallel triangle, except that mathematically that doesn't quite work because you can't have parallel triangles. Um, so I'm talking mathematical nonsense, but you can see what I mean. They are analogous to one another. God, of course, is the apex of both triangles because God is creator and redeemer. He's the creation of all nations of the earth and he's the redeemer of these particular people who chooses them for the sake of the nation. But you can see that there is a parallel between Israel, the nation that God calls for the sake of the nations, and the land which God gives for the sake ultimately of the whole earth. And the same things are said about the land of Israel as about the whole earth. Uh, it belongs to God and it's given to his people. The earth is the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the sons of man, the Psalms say. And the land is the Lord's land, in Leviticus 23, but he has given it. He has entrusted it to the people of Israel, pro tem, uh, in that period. So what that means then, it seems to me, is quite clear. That what God does in that inner triangle of his relationship between Israel and the land at that time and at that point of history becomes an intentional model or pattern or paradigm for what God ultimately wants to be true for the nations in the earth rather than only Israel in its land. That's what I mean by a paradigm. Um, I, I hope you know something about that word, uh, paradigm. Is it on this page? Yes, it is. I'll look at the heading, point five, a model or a paradigm for the nation. Uh, a paradigm is an example or a concrete case which you use as a means of understanding and applying to other situations and cases which vary and may be totally different, but you use a paradigm as a way of applying a principle to other cases. Maybe if we've learned another language at some point, uh, I mean formally learned another language as opposed to being just bilingual or trilingual, as almost everybody in the world is except the British and Americans. Uh, but if you've actually learned another language, you know that you have to learn paradigm words. So as for example, when I learned French, uh, you learn the verb parler, which means to speak or talk. And you learn je parle, tu parles, il parle, nous parlons, vous parlez, il parle. You learn the endings of that verb as a paradigm. Now that's not because that's the only word you're allowed to use in French, or because every time you say something you have to use that verb. No, the, what it means is once you've learned that paradigm, that case, that example, you know how to apply it to other verbs which end in the same way, which are ER verbs. And so you can not only 
be grammatically accurate by using a paradigm to get the correct word when you use it of other verbs, but you can also recognize when things are wrong. If somebody says, uh, vous parlons, you say, ah, oh, that's, that's not right, that doesn't fit, that's a mistake, because it doesn't fit the paradigm. See, the, the ending is wrong, it doesn't fit the paradigm, so you recognize mistakes, you recognize what's gone wrong because you've learned what is right. Now it seems to me that in some ways, well it's not a very full way of explaining it, what God does in creating this people Israel and giving them this law to live in, in their land, at that particular point in human history, in that particular small slice of human culture, is God saying, look guys, here's a model, here's a practical example, here's the way I want people to live when this is their circumstances, when this is the situation in which they live, here's the way, this is what it means to do justice. This is how it means to treat a servant. This is how you should treat your employees. This is what justice looks like in this situation. This is how I want you to use the resources of the earth. Here are some economic principles of compassion and justice in your relationships of finance and debt and interest and land and so on. Here are principles that can apply to your court cases, or to your family life, or to your sexual integrity. And in all of these ways, God says, here's an example, here's a paradigm of the way in which I want human beings to live and work. And so then what we have to do is to take that paradigm from Old Testament Israel and ask some detailed, sometimes hard, sometimes very obvious questions about how that paradigm now implies or applies to the way in which we live in a very different culture, at a different historical era, in different circumstances, but using the same paradigm or model. And so, therefore, it seems to me that the Old Testament law is not just relevant to us as Christians, as the redeemed people of God. It seems to me it also releases the potential of God's law into wider society. Because we are able to say, this is how we know that God wants people to live. Therefore, if these are the kind of standards of justice and compassion that God looks for in his people, then how does that stack up against the society in which we live? How can we use this to bring appropriate critique to the laws and standards and practices of our country? How can we use it to encourage legislators and societies uh, and people to live in ways which are closer to the biblical paradigm rather than opposite to it. And so it gives us a moral compass, not only to know the right way to go and to look for the paradigm in the steps that we take, but also to recognize the wrong ways to go and to see where things have gone astray and are contrary to the way in which God wants us to live. So we can preach Old Testament law that I think to challenge both the church and society on issues of ethics and justice, and social concerns, all those things. If we dig, if we study, if we read, it releases the law into a very fruitful ethical discourse as we read it and study it and discuss it together. Well, that's what I really wanted to bring to you this morning was to get as far as that. Um, tomorrow I'd, I'd like to put some more flesh on this uh, in terms of some of the questions you might ask and some of the exercises we might do. Um, but uh, getting up to that point and seeing, you know, I have the triangle on, the, on the board, the triangle on your paper, seeing this triangular pattern of God, humanity, and the earth, God, Israel, and the nations, and how we can move from one to the other, that at least was uh, the direction I wanted to go this morning. Now, let's give a few minutes because we, we've got a very good time just yet. Uh, to any comments or questions that you might want to ask. I'm sure there's no great prohibition on finishing early uh, if we do, but um, let's at least see what else people might want to say. Okay, one more from here. Uh, just to ask, uh, how, in, in terms of relating to, to, to the nations or to the uh, unbelieving world, where uh, in, in discussion with this model, of Israel under God, uh, the, the understanding perfectly. 
because they have been redeemed by God. But in the wider world, uh, they have a different foundation or whatever it is. Uh, and therefore, in such differences, the clash of, <coughs> of culture, the clash of values, um, how can it uh, be received or imposed? Uh, maybe you can use it from the word, but yeah. 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 How, yeah. Yeah. How, do re- how do you resolve that? Good. Uh, the question that's being asked is, uh, in a world where we're surrounded by people who are not believers and who therefore do not have the same foundation of uh, experience of God's grace and knowledge of God's redemption, uh, how can we then uh, witness to or, uh, you, so to say, impose and then withdrew from it um, biblical values or ethical standards? That's a very good question and, of course, it's important. Um, I, I would want to say, first of all, that we don't impose uh, because we are not uh, as explained to somebody else just earlier on, in Old Testament Israel, the people of God are simultaneously a faith community, the people of the covenant, and uh, a social political structure. They are a state, they are a community under law, under a king, under government, uh, with territorial boundaries and a land and so on. Uh, and so there is therefore, in a sense, an overlap between the moral and spiritual realm of God's law and the social and political realm of the nation. Now, uh, and that is one way in which we understand the penalties and so on within the law and the way in which uh, religious offences are also criminal offences in Old Testament Israel. Now, since the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, uh, and the fulfilment of the Old Testament vision, uh, the community of believers, the community of God's covenant, are now from all peoples, all nations, all over. We are no longer a territorial, ethnic, state community. The people of God is drawn from all nations and all peoples. We are scattered throughout the world. So therefore, we do not have the um, legal right to impose what we might think is God's law on, on the society around us. And usually when Christians have tried to, they end up being as, uh, you know, as tyrannical uh, as, as any other society has ever been because Christians are humans and we're also fallen and when we fall into the trap of thinking that the best way to save the world is to run the world we usually run it very badly uh, as is the experience of Christendom and most other things however does that then mean we've got nothing to say or does it mean that we should keep our Christian ethics within uh, a nice vacuum sealed thermos flask uh, and never allow it out and simply never believe we've been able to say to the world. I think the answer to that is no. And the answer, the reason for that is partly because the God at the apex of the triangle is the creator God as well as the redeemer God. He is the God of all nations and the God of all the earth. And all human beings are accountable to him, morally and ethically and politically and socially. Okay? Whatever religion or culture is there, humanly speaking, from a biblical Christian point of view, but we don't impose it and we can't insist on it, we can't compel it, our theology says that, uh, you know, a George Bush or uh, uh, wherever else one wants to think of, anywhere else in the world, in any other government, Islamic or Hindu or Buddhist or whatever else, they are accountable to the living God for their politics and their society. Just as the Old Testament says that Nebuchadnezzar was, you see. In the Old Testament, Nebuchadnezzar is held accountable to God by Daniel. Pharaoh is held accountable to God by Moses. Uh, the rulers of the other nations are accountable to the living God. Not the gods of their nations, but the, the living God. So the apex of the triangle is the same God. Therefore, what that God requires is going to be morally consistent. If he's the same God and he's morally consistent, then the standards of justice and righteousness which he expects, he expects of all. There's there's not a double standard in the world. We are those who are privileged to have the revelation of God in the scripture and therefore know the extent of our responsibilities as to how we are to live both in the community of faith within the church and in relation to non-Christian society. And so Paul is very clear. He says, you must honor the emperor. You must pay your taxes. You must be good citizens. And I wish more Christian pulpits would preach that. I actually really seriously believe that there is a very profound shortage of teaching on Christian citizenship in the churches as I travel around the world. 
and an awful lot of Christians in many parts of the world are trying to get anywhere else except where they are and to go someplace else, um, get to heaven if they can, go to America if they can, uh, and anywhere else but here. And it seems to me that what Paul is saying, that God has put you here, so be a citizen, be a good citizen, pay your taxes and do good. So there's not a double standard. Uh, we are to witness to those standards of God in our community and where we can to seek to cooperate with people of goodwill and of ethical standards to seek to be salt and light in a corrupt and a dark world. And that's the language of Jesus. And salt is what stems corruption and light is what breaks up the darkness. They are both invasive words, salt and light. But as Jesus said, there's no point having salt that's useless, and there's no point having light that's hidden. So the assumption of those verses, salt and light, is that it is possible for Christian believers, disciples of Jesus, to actually do something about the corruption in the world. And it's possible for believers to shed a bit of light into the darkness of the world. Which doesn't mean we're going to bring in the kingdom of God by our own strength. It means that our responsibility is to live and witness by the standards of God and seek to move our societies in that direction where we can. Where we can. And we know that we often can't, but that doesn't absolve us from the responsibility of living and witnessing to the standards of God's justice. Maybe the last example I give of that is Daniel. Because Daniel 4 is a wonderful chapter, isn't it? Uh, in Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylonian Empire, has a bad dream. Like in Sonia, he was, he had a bad dream. Uh, and he sees that this throne, uh, that is, uh, this tree rather, is going to be chopped down. And he realizes, or he doesn't realize what it is. Daniel says, it's you. Uh, you are for the chop, Nebuchadnezzar. And then Daniel goes one step further. And in verse 27, Daniel, who was a Jewish believer, but who was a civil servant in the government of Babylon. That's important. He had a, quote, secular job, as we might call it. He was a civil servant uses wonderfully civil servant political language to Nebuchadnezzar. He says, okay, be pleased to accept my advice. I love that phrase. Because uh, Nebuchadnezzar hadn't asked for any advice. He just wanted his dream uninterpreted. But ne Daniel says, be pleased to accept my advice. What is his advice? He says, do justice to the poor. Stop oppressing them. And it may be that God will allow your kingdom to continue. Now that is a precisely prophetic word. That's like Amos or Isaiah had said to Israelite kings. And here Daniel, a civil servant, as where for a, just a split second puts on a prophet's robe and speaks to the top man of the top empire of his day, which wasn't certainly wasn't Christian, let alone Jewish. And yet he speaks into the ear of that king a word that comes directly from the law of Moses. Do justice and stop oppressing the poor. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't pay any attention. He chose not to. And God judged him. But the interesting thing is that in that context, the word from a man of faith to a man of a totally different religion was based upon the values and the standards of the law of God in Moses. That seems to me to be an interesting example of the responsibility of believers in the world, in the marketplace, in the political way. Any other questions? Hmm. Here. Okay. Is it is it better to uh, preach in the Old Testament uh, in a thematic topical manner rather than just uh, take a chapter at a time in Christ? So that would be quite difficult because uh, you know. Thank you. The question was, is it uh, better perhaps to preach the Old Testament in a more thematic, more topical way, rather than just sort of chapter by chapter? I think my answer to that is, 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 is fairly flexible. Um, I, mean, I, I do believe that there is a huge value in, uh, in planning your preaching in such a way that there is a fair amount of fairly systematic preaching from specific books of the Bible. Which doesn't necessarily mean that you have to preach a whole book of the Bible all at once, or all in one series. 
Um, I mean, you might choose, let's say, it was the book of Deuteronomy, to preach the first 11 chapters for a few weeks, um, and then take a break and go somewhere into the New Testament, and then come back and do a little bit more. Uh, so I, I do think it's good to give people a, an exposure to a whole chunk of Scripture so they get their heads around it, and they begin to say, ah, you know, now I know what this book's about. I've got some sense of understanding. You know, the, the structure of this book, the background of it, why it's there, what its main message is. So I, I think there is great value in, in making a, a substantial part of your preaching ministry uh, biblically expository in a systematic kind of way. However, uh, I, I, I do also believe there is value in variety. And so I think it's perfectly possible uh, to take a theme and then handle it in the Bible through both Testaments. I mean, for example, you could take the theme of compassion or justice. Uh, and you could say, well, let's see what the Bible as a whole has to say about God's understanding of justice. Uh, and, you know, include something from Abraham, um, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? That's a very strange form of justice when you get down to the uh, encounter over Sodom and Gomorrah. It seems to go totally the wrong way. Uh, or um, then the Exodus, or then the laws about justice, and then some of the prophetic texts, and some of the Psalms, and what the Proverbs has to say. And, you know, the, uh, the righteous man cares about justice for the poor, but the unrighteous has no such concern, says Proverbs. Uh, and so, and then to the New Testament, Jesus, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, or seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things will be added to you. So you, you could do a thematic approach and, you know, take it through the scriptures. And that's a good way of bringing the law in. So I would urge you, brothers and sisters, that if you do decide to preach a Bible theme or topic, please don't start only with Matthew, or even just with Isaiah 53 or something. But please get back into the habit of thinking through the whole of the Bible. You know, preaching the Bible as a whole doesn't mean that you preach every verse in the Bible, you know, Sunday by Sunday, and take you 150 years or something. Um, but what it does mean is every time you think of a theme or a topic that you say, well, now I wonder how can I shed the light of the different parts of the Bible narrative on this? Uh, what light is shed on this theme from creation? Genesis. What light is shed on this issue from the stories of the patriarchs and the narratives of Abraham, faith and obedience? What does the law say about this issue? Are there texts in Exodus or Deuteronomy which address this issue. And there probably are, because it's such a rich seared part. And then you bring the law into your preaching of that theme. And then you might move to the narratives and the stories and say, well, perhaps you've got some very good stories. Or you might move to the Psalms, and then the wisdom, and then the prophets, and then the gospels, and then the epistles. Uh, so that you, you get into the habit of helping your church, your people, to see that the Bible is a whole story, it's a whole you know, panorama. <coughs> of God's revelation and truth. Um, I love the, um, the balance in the Apostle Paul's teaching ministry in Ephesus. Did you ever notice it? Do you remember when Paul is talking in Acts 20 to the elders of the Ephesian churches when he's visiting them? And I say churches because probably there were a number of assemblies in the great metropolis of Ephesus. And Paul gathered these elders together, do you remember, in the docks? and has a word with them, and Luke has recorded what Paul says in Acts 20. And Paul says two things that he had not hesitated to do. He says, I did not hesitate to preach to you whatever was needful for you. Now that seems to me to be a very topical, issue-based form of preaching. Whatever the question was, whatever the problem was, Paul would preach on it. Uh, so if it was meat sacrifice to idols, like in Corinthians, he would tell them about it. If it was the issue of uh, could they uh, go to an idol temple or not? Paul would teach about it. So Paul is preaching, as it were, on issues that were relevant to the day-to-day -day needs of the churches. That's, that's relevant, topical preaching. But then a few verses later, Paul says, I did not hesitate to preach to you the whole counsel of God. Wonderful expression. It means the whole plan of God, the whole will of God. I quite happily express as the whole mission of God. Because I think what Paul would mean by that expression is the whole purpose of God from creation to new creation. God is creator, chooser of Abraham, 
Redeemer from Exodus, Giver of the Prophets, Sender of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the Holy Spirit, the Church and Mission. The whole counsel of God basically means the Bible story. And so what I think Paul was doing in those daily teaching sessions in the whole of Tyrannus in Ephesus was that he was systematically instructing these people in the whole story of the Bible and helping them to see their way through from beginning to end, to understand who they were and what God had done for them in the light of the Scriptures. At any rate, if you read the letter to the Ephesians, it's clear he had done that. Because in Ephesians, Paul keeps referring back to Old Testament language and texts. He says, you used to be far off, you were separate from Israel, you didn't belong to the Messiah, you didn't know about God's promises, you were without God uh, and without hope in the world. But now, he says, you've been brought in, you've become fellow citizens, you've been built into the foundation of God's people. And he's using Old Testament language, which assumes he must have taught that to them previously. They knew about these things because Paul had taught the whole scripture. So my answer to you really is do both. Be thematic, be topical, but when you are, also be biblical. Bring the whole Bible into the theme. But don't forget also to do the effort and the work of going back to a book, a Bible book, and saying, let me break up this loaf to the people. They can't get it all of their lives at once. You can't swallow a whole loaf at once. But let me break up this loaf, small, and keep feeding it to the people, piece by piece, until eventually they benefit from the whole loaf, the whole book of God's Word. Is there time for one more question before we break? I think we probably have. All right, it's a very Just a quick question. Uh, earlier you had, you had us do an exercise looking at Psalm 119. How do we get away from the language or, or the apparent language of a, a quid pro quo kind of uh, uh, obedience or blessing sort of uh, thing. Yeah. Thank you. That's a very good question because, of course, uh, the question was how do we get away from a quid pro quo approach to blessing and obedience? Uh, and, of course, one has to say that that is very much the essence of the so-called prosperity gospel, isn't it? Um, and an awful lot of that teaching uh, which sort of has this idea, if you, you know, if you put your your bit into the heavenly slot machine, you'll get so much back out, you know, so many chocolate bars and wealth and um, cars and everything else. And it's a very, well, it seems to me to be very little more than kind of sanctified selfishness, and actually not very sanctified even that. <laughs> to me, really, the basic answer to your question is preached race. Because, you see, when when you constantly remind yourself that you would not even be here if it were not for God's grace, that without God's grace I am an undeserving sinner and would be totally destroyed, not only as a sinner before I became a Christian, but as a sinner since I've been a Christian. In fact, I've been far more conscious of sin in my life as a Christian than ever I was before because I became a Christian at about six. And, uh, even with the most jaundiced view of childhood, I don't think I was <laughs> the wickedest of sinners uh, by the age of six. But since then, um, through a profound understanding of the wickedness of the human heart, and not just what I have been, but what I could easily be if it were not for the grace of God. You know, where we could easily fall to if it were not for the grace of God. Then it seems to me that any idea that I can somehow pop a piece of obedience into God's basket and expect a great blessing out in response to how good I've been just becomes ludicrous. It just becomes nonsensical uh, because the, the profound sense in which you come into God's presence saying, Lord, I don't deserve to be here at all. So anything that goes on now between us is a matter of your grace, not my deserves. Um, so, you see, when when you read the Psalms, it, it would be easy sometimes, like Psalm 119, to imagine that there's a certain quid pro quo going on, that these Psalms just say, hey, oh, you look at me, you know, I, I'm righteous, I'm this, I'm that, so please bless me. I, I think we need to think more deeply than that and recognize that often that claim to righteousness may be a forensic one, it may be based on a court case that's happening, and the Psalms are saying, Lord, you know that I'm not guilty of this offense, so please vindicate me. Uh, it's not that I'm sinless, it's not that I'm morally perfect, 
but I don't deserve this attack, this, this accusation, I'm being, this is unfair. And so the psalmist is pleading with God to vindicate his righteousness in this case. And that's perfectly open, I think, also for Christians to do. Say, Lord, you know, you know, you know my heart, you know where I stand in this, you know that I don't deserve what's happening here. Uh, but I leave it to you to, to take action. So sometimes it's that, and sometimes it is this uh, sense in which the psalmist is saying, Lord, you said that because you saved us and because we are redeemed, we are to obey your law. That's what I'm trying to do, Lord. I, I am seeking to live in a way which is honoring to you. I'm not claiming to be perfect, but I am seeking to live according to your law. Like Psalm 1, you know, blessed is the man who delights in God's law and who meditates on it, who studies it, and who wants to keep it. And I think there is a quality of life which pleases God. Uh, when God sees people who are committed to discipleship and obedience, God is pleased. And uh, it's one of the reasons, this is a sort of way of finishing, it's one of the reasons why I used to puzzle over this fact when I was principal of All Nations Christian College, where I was for years, 13 years, why it was that it always seemed that, you know, God was smiling on us. You know, there was a sense, that, I don't mean there wasn't struggles, but there was a sense, I always had a sense in that place, that it was a place that was enjoying God's rich blessing and a sense of God's smile. That's how I sensed it. And, and the answer that came to me was, well, this is a community of men and women who are trying to obey God. <laughs> Here are people, to, it was a missionary training college from all over the world, not just Western missionaries, but everywhere. Here is a community of people who have said yes to Jesus. They're not perfect. They're sinners. They're fallen. But they are people who know the grace of the Lord and who are saying, yes, Lord, we want to obey you. We will follow you. We will do what it costs. We will make that sacrifice if that's what it costs. But Lord, we want to obey. And, and you see, God promises that where people are obedient, His blessing will be. Not necessarily material blessing or all those great things. But that obedience is the way of living within the blessing of God. Uh, and that's not quid pro quo. It's just something of the generosity of God's grace. That's the way in which it is. So that's the kind of example where I would probably want to finish this morning. Um, and I hope it's uh, been just a little bit helpful as a sort of orientation to how to think about God's law. Eric, should we stop there? Should I pray? Uh, okay. Let's pray together. Our loving God and Father, we've spent the morning with this enormous privilege of having our eyes and our minds in your word. Uh, we realize, Lord, that it's a privilege even to do that, that we've been able to take time aside from the world and from our work uh, and to have the, the leisure to, to do this. It's a great joy, a great privilege that we have your word. And so we pray that, as James says, we may not be hearers only, but doers also, and that uh, you would, uh, where necessary, challenge us and rebuke us, but more particularly that you would encourage and motivate us take your word seriously and to read places that we perhaps not read before and where they're strange and puzzling that you would illuminate them to us by your Holy Spirit or point us in the direction of books and helps that will enable us to understand your word more clearly. Thank you Lord that you are the same God, that you are the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Isaiah and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the Apostle Paul and all the Apostles and all the saints and martyrs died through the ages and that you are not ashamed to be called our God today. So we thank you Lord. We ask that you would bless us and encourage us and bring us back tomorrow to a fresh encounter with your word. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you.